Dr. Tao, Alex, take it away. Right. Thank you, Gary. And of course, thank you everyone for joining us for this evening's webinar. Our topic uh, for the month of March is MCAT Mastery Question Analysis and Time Management. So this will actually be pretty helpful for a lot of you who are going to be taking the MCAT soon. And that's actually a question I want to ask for a lot of you here. Uh, when are you taking the MCAT? If you can write in the chat if you're taking it this month, April, May, June, summer, maybe next year, 2025, 2026. All right. And I can see there are a ton of you who are taking it very soon. A lot of April, May, June. A good number of you taking it this summer as well. And I'm seeing 2025, 2026 as well. So many of you are starting early with your prep. It's fantastic. All right. So let's go ahead and jump in. So Gary gave us a brief introduction. So I'm just going to explain a little bit more about my background and Alex is going to as well. My name is Ken. I am the director of MCAT for Med School Coach. I completed my undergraduate studies at UC Berkeley and then my PhD in neuroscience at Harvard. And I have been in the MCAT space for now just over 11 years. For the first five years, I was with the Princeton Review where I was a senior MCAT instructor premier tutor and instructor trainer for the company. So that means I used to fly all across the country training new people to become MCAT instructors for the Princeton Review. Then while I was in Boston, I was discovered by the founder and CEO of Med School Coach, and I was recruited to start our MCAT division. And our MCAT division has now been in existence for just over six years. So a total of 11 years and really happy to be here and hopefully share some helpful thoughts and insights that will help you with your MCAT preparation. And Alex, if you want to introduce yourself. Absolutely. Thanks, Ken. Happy to be here. I hope everybody's having a good night. Um, so I've been with Med School Coach for about six years and then in the MCAT space for just over eight. And I've really focused a lot on the content development for a med school coach products um, like our full links and our app. Um, and I've also had a, a big hand in the tutoring and education programs that we have. Personally, I have tutored just about 500 students for the MCAT. So you could probably tell uh, it's a passion of mine is to help students get prepared for that. Um, and I still do that uh, today. So Awesome. So just a few reminders because I guarantee I'm going to get this question in the chat and in the Q&A. So the question is, will this webinar be recorded and will you get sent a copy of this recording? The answer is yes. You can also see it in the chat. All of you who register for this webinar will receive an email with a recording of this webinar. So you can review it at your leisure later on, or if you have to leave early and want to watch the rest of the webinar later on, you will be able to do so. Number two, you are welcome to ask questions at any time. Remember, Zoom does have the Q&A feature. So we're going to be spending most of today's presentation going over some important strategies and uh, techniques for them, Kat. But we're also going to be answering your specific questions. Finally, the last thing I'm going to mention is as a thank you for joining us for this evening's webinar, we're going to be dropping a couple of links in the chat occasionally throughout the presentation, essentially as a thank you for joining us and spending this evening learning about the MCAT and how Med School Coach can help you prepare for the MCAT exam. So with that, let's talk about today's agenda. We're going to start off by talking about strategies for analyzing complex MCAT questions. Right, so we're going to be diving right in. This is one of the most difficult aspects of the MCAT, where there's some questions on the exam that aren't that difficult. You read it and you say, oh, I, I just need to know the science fact. I know it. I got the right answer. But other times you get to a question and it's a long question stem. You read it. You have no idea what it's about. Right, so we're going to talk about some strategies for how to deal with those complex questions. And at the same time, those complex questions makes it difficult for you to pace yourself and manage your time during the exam. So we're gonna also gonna talk about some time management strategies. And of course, uh, what you often hear in a lot of these presentations are generic strategies and tips for how to improve your MCAT score. We do wanna make this more practical. So we're going to be going through 
several MCAT questions where we're going to be providing a live demonstration of some of these test taking strategies. And as I mentioned earlier, there's going to be an open Q&A at the end. So please feel free to submit your questions and we will answer them as they come. So with that, Alex. All right. So analyzing complex MCAT questions. So the first point I want to make should go for all MCAT questions. And I find it's the the number one sort of problem solving step in a, in a student's process where they think they got it, but they don't. Now I'm going to give some examples here. So identifying the core concept being tested, that usually isn't that point. You know, like, okay, it's physics. What's my topic? Maybe it's fluids. Is there a subtopic? Ah, they're, they're asking me about Bernoulli's principle or pressure or something like that. But a lot of times the question sim has a word that is very crucial. Um, we would call that a descriptive word or a qualifying word. And the analogy I like to give is imagine uh, your friend or your, your parent asked you to go to the store and get some milk. You're like, okay, great. But they asked for lactose free milk. If you just read or, or think, all right, I'm going to the store to get some milk. You go to the store, you get normal milk, and the lactose free, that descriptive, that qualifying word, makes all of the difference in what you would select. And that uh, it seems like a kind of a funny analogy, but it's really, really true. So those descriptive words um, and sort of details that are nested inside of a what you think is just a straightforward science question turn out to be your, your best friends when uh, trying to answer the question. So when we're trying to break questions down, um, the goal of this is so that we can move away from the idea that I'm going to answer the question or I'm going to do the problem because those aren't actionable items. It's like setting a big goal for yourself, like I wanna to go to medical school. Um, that's not really an actionable item, but there are a lot of steps along the way, like a study for the MCAT, get good grades, research, you know, those kinds of things. And that's what we're trying to do here. Um, one example would be if you needed to, I don't know, calculate voltage using Ohm's law. Well, you may have to realize that you're gonna to go to the passage for a graph that gives you the current, and then you're going to have to read about resistance, but maybe do a, a preparatory calculation in order to get the resistance that you'll need to use. By really analyzing and scrutinizing the words in the question stem, you won't go astray. Um, and if there's something that's a little confusing in the question stem, uh, this approach of breaking it down is going to allow you to identify if there's an area that you weren't sure about. So for clues, there's two parts of this that I want to talk about. Um, highlighting keywords and phrases that guide your thought process is something that you tend to do while you're reading the passage, before you even get to the question. It doesn't have to be, but we'll start there. So as you start to highlight, there is a lot of advice out there on what to highlight. Uh, for example, physics passages. If you want to highlight numbers, that makes sense, right? But it's actually not a very good strategy to highlight a bunch of numbers because they stand out next to the text. Um, but like relationships and mechanisms, things like that are really good to highlight. However, for you personally, you would want to be able to review your passages and, and really think, hmm, did what I highlight help me once I got to the, the questions? And if it did, fantastic. Pat on the back, just keep keep doing what you're doing um, if it helped you. But if it didn't, or if you could see an area that you could improve, you want to be able to put that into, into practice. Um, certain highlighting and focus on the question stem itself can be useful. If you have a really meaty question stem that's two, two and a half sentences, uh, you might want to highlight certain words. I think that those detailed words I was talking about a moment ago, that's a great thing to highlight in the question stem. Draws your attention, makes you focus a little bit a little bit uh, more there. And then of course, words like not and least. I'm sure a lot of us who have, who have done MCAT questions have gotten those questions wrong because uh, we didn't pay enough attention to not or an exception. All right, so practice and review. These, this is extremely important. Once you sort of get your content review squared away and you know the topics fairly well, you know the best that you can, 
can't memorize everything, right? But you feel comfortable moving into a practice-based approach now. The review is really the magic. So all of the practice is just doing your best. You have a practice exam or a set of questions you're doing, you just do your best. And then when you review, that's where you draw all of the all of the meat from the passage and the questions so that you can, uh, I think the attitude you should have is, I'm going to review this passage and question so well that I could never get it wrong, like in any universe, right? So that you know it, you could explain it to your friend. Um, so that would be sort of your, your level of, of review there. Great. And keep in mind, right, we're talking about what these strategies are, but in a few more slides, we're going to go through some actual questions and demonstrate some of these strategies. Alrighty, so some of the big MCAT challenges. So prioritizing weak areas might seem really obvious, but how do you put that into practice? Um, so uh, let's say, uh, we'll just say chem chemistry and physics is a weak spot. We'll just pick one at random. Well, as you're preparing, you can't just spend all of your time on chem fit. You can't do that because everything else will start to start to um, wane and get weak or rusty for that matter. And I've seen this happen a lot with students um, where they have a big fear. Maybe it's, maybe it is chemists or cars and they spend all of their time for like a month. And yeah, they improve. It's actually kind of impressive with all that focus, but everything else has dropped a couple of points and it's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot. So my recommendation for prioritizing, prioritizing weak areas is just double the section that you need to work on. And you can get as detailed as, as you need. Um, if it is a, you know, a handful of topics from a certain section, well, great. Uh, throughout your, your week as you're practicing all of the sections, one day is a bonus day for just that section. Um, if it is an entire section, still, same approach. You just double it for that week. And once that area is brought up to snuff, kind of matching your other sections, then you move on to another one to double it. But then you, you never stop focusing on the entire exam. Works pretty well, pretty well. It's manageable. All right, strategy over memorization. This, there are many standardized tests out there that you can get very far with uh, just memorizing and being a pro, and it's not the MCAT. Um, the people that score the highest on the MCAT are not the ones who have the most content memorized, I promise you. They have a fair amount memorized, but, but not the most. So we like to recommend to developing problem solving strategies or a, approaches, not just you know, group memorization. And I'll give you an example here. Um, let's say that you're trying to remember or you're trying to memorize all of your equations because why would you not memorize your equations, right? That's a good idea. You should do that. So you're memorizing your equations, but you're kind of that's just rote memorization. It's really difficult to apply the right equation if you don't know the scenario in which you're being asked to use it. Because how many equations are there for like electric field? Well, we use some in certain uh, situations, some in other situations. So the uh, strategy of then the problem solving skill while you study is to study equations with those contexts in mind. So you don't just have a flashcard of your equation. You have a flashcard that has the units. You have the equation. You have the scenarios in which you would use them and the scenarios in which you would use them. You would not use them. You would use a different equation. So there's your strategy uh, pretty much for um, problem solving and, and learning while you're studying. So practicing under pressure is really important. Really, really important. You don't want to you know, buckle on test day um, and choke once you get up to that. It's not, it's not good, it's not good. So simulating the exam conditions the best you can is really helpful. Now, what this, what we recommend this to look like, what I tell my students to do is to try and get some sort of public computer, almost always at the library and a desktop computer. So it has a, it's not, it's not like a, a MacBook or something where you have a trackpad. It's in a public place, though it's fairly quiet, but there are distractions. And you start as close to on time as you can. So that means early morning. Most, or I won't say most, many people start their MCAT at like 7.30 in the morning. So 
try and do that, adhere to the breaks. Um, there will probably be noises around you. If you're able to do it at a library, that's a good thing because there will be noises around you on test day. So that is, that's my recommendation. And do that a lot. Do that with every practice exam you do. Doing it at home in your, in like in your bedroom with your, you know, your cell phone on the desk, um, that's just a recipe for, you know, getting lulled into a false sense of security that you can do this because the stress isn't, the stress isn't there. And to study with your peers um, who are kind of like at the same, around the same level that you're um, for the MCAT. Or if you're, you know, you're trying to ask somebody that has taken the MCAT before, um, but maybe they didn't do so well, or it's been a few years since they've taken it, and you know, maybe they're a medical school now and they don't remember. So I really recommend uh, to everybody to try and find some sort of mentor who, you know, has done well on the MCAT, understands the exam, and sort of point out the things that you're not seeing. Um, the analogy I like to use is like if you're you know drowning in a river swimming by, you're you're not going to get so much help from somebody else who's in the river. But if someone's standing on shore, sure, they're going to be able to, to pull you out. It's still going to be a lot of work, but um, it it's kind of like you're you're shot there. You have somebody to help you out there. So that's my recommendation on seeking feedback is don't try to look too much to your peers. Um, try to find somebody who's been through the process. You know, and has been successful at it. Nice. And just to clarify, because I did see a student ask about the, the double aspect ratio or double aspect. Uh, uh, and essentially what Alex was trying to emphasize is for a lot of students, when they're studying for MCAT, you know there's a lot of different subjects tested, right? There's general chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, biology, biochemistry, psychology, and sociology. Chances are there's some subjects that you're stronger in and other subjects that you're weaker in. And sometimes students have the tendency of focusing on their stronger subjects because they feel more comfortable mm. studying those subjects, right? And avoiding their weaker subjects, which is not good because if you avoid organic chemistry because you're, you have a fear of organic chemistry, then you can't really expect to improve there, right? But uh, even if you have a student who decides to take a very uh, sort of balanced approach and says, all right, I'm going to study seven days a week and each day I'm going to study a different subject. I'm going to cycle through the different subjects, but I'm going to study them evenly. That might not produce the best outcome either because for topics that you understand well, it shouldn't take you as much time to study those subjects because you've already learned them before and you simply have to review them. But for subjects where you don't understand very well, it's gonna take you longer because you're not simply reviewing the topics. Sometimes you have to relearn the topics correctly for the first time. And because of that, you might wanna double the amount of time you're spending on weaker topics uh, as compared to stronger topics. Exactly. All right. All right. So managing time on exam day. And this is also kind of leading up to exam day. I have some uh, some things we'll talk about with that as well. But, like very, very important. Um, so for pacing, now it's very normal in the beginning of your MCAT prep um, when you're answering questions and doing full lengths and, and section exams to struggle with time. Uh, struggling with time is a, a symptom of some something else. So it's always the result of something else. Um, and it's so different, you're really going to have to be self-reflective and um, examine what it is. Um, but being able to have a good pacing strategy on testing when you have so much experience and you are finishing section on time is really important. If you have a good idea, and you should by testing, um, of what your strengths and weaknesses are, this makes the whole, the whole process a lot easier. Let me give you an example. Let's say that for whatever reason, um, circuit just never made sense to you. Voltage drop was just a concept that couldn't wrap your head around. That's that's okay. That's okay. That's one that's one topic. And you're going through chem fizz on, on a section exam or a full length or test day, and you run into a circuit problem that seems kind of complicated or even not that complicated. If you were to look at the question 
and you didn't know how to get started, then you probably shouldn't spend very much time. So my recommendation there, is like, okay, this may be a, a question I have to sacrifice in order to get multiple other questions correct. Because there are, are questions that are just ungettable for everyone. You know, they're, who knows what you'll see on test day. And so if you can identify those based off your strengths and weaknesses, you can bank time so that you can have time to get sort of what I call gray area questions. Those ones where, oh, if I just had 10 more seconds, I could make sure I was right. You'll get those ones correct now. Um, and then you'll have um, ample time uh, at the end to review questions when you need to. Um, monitoring progress, this can, this can be really tough and everybody is different. So I'm gonna go over a couple scenarios uh, because some people can look at the clock so much that they panic and kind of kind of a snowball effect. Um, you know, the panic sets in, too stressed out, you can't pay attention, you're looking back at the clock now, now you're behind, so you're even more, yeah, so it's just a snowball effect. Um, so I recommend, oh, and I should mention, on your exam, that you can toggle the clock on it. Some people like to leave it off and just check periodically, like maybe every 30 questions, make sure they're about a third of the way through. Um, sorry, uh, about halfway through. I got that wrong. Um, but I recommend uh, checking every two passages. In every two passages, you don't need to get you know fancy. You don't need to think, okay, I have only eight minutes for this passage, nine minutes for this passage. Just make sure you're around 16 minutes or so every two passages. 15 minutes even is okay. That's, I think most people see, thought that I've seen uh, to manage the stress and also to be effective not falling behind. Uh, but if you find that your the exam is becoming about watching the clock, then that's definitely a problem you want to want to address. And maybe it's time to um, just change up how often you're looking and hide the hide the clock. So a quick deci decision making. Uh, this kind of goes back to the first point as well, like knowing knowing what you're going to do with that question and. If you, so place, or sorry, areas that are good areas to spend time on with the question are understanding the question and then retrieving the information you need in order to solve it. Those are good areas to spend time. Bad areas to spend time are when you've sort of done that, but you're really stuck between two answer choices. This is especially true for cars, by the way. Um, and you keep going back between two answer choices and maybe you're like, oh, well, I'll go back to the passage and then you come back to the answer choice and you're still stuck. That is a poor area to spend time. You don't wanna to spend too much time doing that because chances are it's not going to, not gonna turn out any different than it did when you initially got stuck between two. All right, so your pre-exam pre -exam routine, I would recommend doing your pre-exam routine for your practice exams as well, at least the last month of the practice exam. So I recommend really ramping down the week of a practice test. You know, think of it kind of like a sporting event. Um, you know, you want to be rested, you want to have full mental capacity, you want to be fresh, you know, those kinds of things. You don't want to be cramming the day before a full length. You're trust me, you're not going to you're not going to remember or learn anything that will actually help you the next day. Um, but maybe if your exam is on Saturday, Wednesday is a half day, Thursday is passive flashcards for a few hours, and then Friday, certainly take it off. It's also important to be going to bed, waking up, um, you know, the same times as you will on test day. Uh, I would, again, I would say about a month out from the exam, it becomes kind of important to get into that routine. Um, before you take your actual MCAT, make sure you have gone to the exam center a couple of times. Be aware of tra any traffic revisions that might be coming up because uh, that you don't want to be late, mostly because of the stress that you'll <clears throat> you'll start to feel just for yourself. They probably won't turn, turn you away if you're just a few minutes late. <clears throat> and then the day of, I think what is important is to have, be hydrated, but not too hydrated, right? Find that, that sweet spot eat well, all of the normal, uh, all of the normal mental and physical hygiene. 
Um, you want to be comfortable, so you wear comfortable clothes. Um, you don't uh, want to have any sort of struggle going in and out of the testing room. So that was that is a uh, also meditation is great. You know, have some sort of meditation, whatever that looks like for you. There's so many different ways to do it. Um, and, you know, on your way to the testing center it might be a good time to again reset those stress levels, bring it down because once you start the exam, they're going to go up. Um, so th those are those are my top tips. Nice. So a lot of a lot of really helpful tips there, and I know we're starting to accumulate a few more questions in the chat, but I do want to keep this presentation moving. So if we don't answer the question while it's in the chat, please remember you can submit them in the Q and A section because they're less likely to essentially get wiped out as the chat keeps moving. So. Uh, before we actually talk about some MCAT questions, again, we said we we're going to demonstrate some of these strategies live. I did want to drop our first special link for all of you uh, who are with us uh, this evening. Uh, this has to do with our MCAT prep mobile application. So before I drop the code, I just want to ask if anyone in the chat uh, is perhaps using our mobile application and perhaps has some words or thoughts on this mobile application. It is simply called the MCAP Prep app, right? You can find it on iOS devices. You can find it on Android devices. And it's you'll find it just by looking up MCAP, it really is the highest rated uh, MCAP Prep mobile application. And I am glad to see in the chat, there is so far a couple of you who have mentioned to us that you're using the app and you're enjoying it. I'm very glad to hear that. So. This mobile application, uh, it's pretty handy for students who essentially want to be able to study the MCAT uh, on their phones. So sometimes if uh, you're traveling and you're not uh, able to uh, have a textbook or computer in front of you, it's nice to be able to have a mobile phone to be able to just watch some MCAT videos, review some high yield science content, go through some practical questions, go through some flashcards, right? So this is a really nice study aid that you just open on your mobile devices. And what we're actually offering uh, for all of you who are here with us this evening is a special offer where you can sign up for a lifetime subscription to the MCAT prep app for uh, $69.99. So I've dropped the link in the chat. And again, this is a lifetime subscription. So even if you're not taking the MCAT this year, if you're looking to take the MCAT in 2025, 2026, there's really no reason not to just lock in this price now and get lifetime access to the MCAT prep mobile application. It is really helpful for students MCAT preparation, although you know, to some degree, I'm probably a little biased because in that app, you'll probably notice that I'm in quite a lot of the videos explaining the science content. But again, lots of really good practice questions, flashcards, lecture notes, as well as whiteboard notes to help students review the science information that's tested on the MCAT. So again, if you're interested, go ahead and use that link and go ahead and sign up for lifetime access. This offer is only going to be available for the next 24 hours. So do make sure that if you're interested, you sign up soon. All right. So from here, let's go ahead and jump into a live demonstration. And in, instead of just diving straight in, I, I figure for at least you know, a couple of these questions, I'll go ahead and set up a poll so all of you can go ahead and give this a try. We were talking about timing earlier. Right, so this first question, it's a cars question. For the cars section, you've got 90 minutes uh, to complete 53 questions. There's also nine passages. So usually students think of it as 10 minutes per passage, but you have to keep in mind, it's gonna take you several minutes to read the passage, uh, and then you have to then answer the questions. Right, so it's not necessarily 10, uh, 90 minutes for 53 questions. It's really less than that because a lot of your time is spent reading the passages. So it's less time per question, but I'll go ahead and set up a poll. All of you can go ahead and give this question a try and we'll go over it shortly.
All right, it's time. So if you were thinking that was really fast, well, remember what we said earlier, time pressure is a big deal in the exam, right? So you do have to be able to answer questions quickly. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in, right? So this question asks, uh, the phrase briefly dismisses in paragraph one implies that Vivero de Castro blank, right? So remember what we said earlier, um, highlighting, there are some words that you can highlight that can be helpful uh, for the MCAT, right? So in this case, what would I choose to highlight? Well, what I would choose to highlight in this case would be, you know, the key words, right? Briefly dismisses and Vivero de Castro. Now, why do I highlight these keywords? Well, these keywords are going to guide me as to what part of the passage I should be using to answer this question. So, of course, when I'm looking at this paragraph of text, which is paragraph one, I've got to find this phrase, uh, Breezley dismisses and Viveros de Castro, right? It's helping me to more quickly identify the bright part of the passage to answer the question. Because very often when students are missing questions in cards, it's because they're using the wrong part of the passage. They didn't find the right part of the text to answer the question. So in this case, if we see here, in an influential lecture, Viveros de Castro pointed out David Graeber as an example of an anthropologist who still breezily dismisses apparently irrational beliefs. In this case, that a charm called Ravalolona can stop hailstorms from falling on farmers' crops as untrue in the literal sense and therefore having to be explained as a projection of social relations of some sort. That was a long sentence. And that's common in the MCAT car section, right? But again, you highlight the keywords in the question, you locate the appropriate text in the passage, and now let's take a look at the answer choices. We've got A. So A states does not think that apparently rational beliefs are worth serious consideration. So if you were one of the few students who picked A, you were actually correct because that is indeed what breezily dismisses refers to, right? Dismisses means that you don't agree. And if you breezily dismiss something, that means you quickly did not think much of it. So if you don't think they are worth serious consideration, you would breezily dismiss these apparently irrational beliefs. But of course, you'd also want to check that other answer choices confirm that they're incorrect. So if you take a look at B, views the arguments of Graeber and similar anthropologists as reflecting a failure to take the cultures they analyze seriously. One of the challenges that students often have when they're completing cars passages and questions is they're often focused too much on the contents of the passage, right? What exactly was the passage saying? Uh, and the reason why is often when you look at uh, explanations for cars questions, they're usually in the format of, oh, for this question, you were supposed to look at this paragraph, this phrase was stated, that's why this is correct, right? But that doesn't really teach you how to eliminate wrong answer choices, right? Because wrong answer choices usually come in several flavors on the MCAT. And in this case, what makes B incorrect, it's not that it's uh, wrong according to the passage, right? B actually matches what's being stated in the passage. The problem with B is that it doesn't answer the question. So if you miss B, you have to be thinking, hey, I can't pick an answer choice that's simply true based on the passage. I also have to pick an answer that answers the question at hand. Now, if you take a look at C, uh, disagrees with empirical evidence marshaled by Graver and Evans Pritchard regarding the cultures they studied. You can eliminate C for the same reason as B. It may be true based on what the passage said, but if it doesn't answer the question, a true statement is not a correct answer. And finally, uh, D thinks that older arguments made in anthropology need to be reevaluated in light of modern findings. So why is this also a challenge? So the reason why uh, there is a challenge is thinks that older arguments 
made in anthropology need be reevaluated in light of modern scientific findings. The reason why this is an issue is that this is essentially irrelevant to what's being stated in the passage. So if this is irrelevant to what's being stated in the passage, that means D is incorrect. So again, the main things that you want to look for with your answer choices is not only identifying the correct answer choice, but also with the incorrect answer choices, being able to understand essentially what is the way that you can correctly categorize them as being incorrect. Okay, so this was our first question and I can see there, there's a number of questions here with some confusion. Okay, so, oh. I see, funny enough, I see, I see a lot of people, uh, a lot of people did, did identify an error, which in this case, I realize now, funny enough, I did make an error here. Um, so in this case, uh, yes. So I actually flipped this, so I have the, I have the correct explanation, but I mixed up the answer choices. So I do apologize for that. So I think for a lot of people, you're, you're probably gonna feel better now. Indeed, if you pick B, you're correct, All right? So B uh, does match what's being stated. Indeed, everyone has the right logic in B. That was my error, I apologize. But if you look at A, does not think that apparently irrational beliefs are worth serious consideration, this still traps a lot of students because when they look at this phrase, briefly dismisses apparently irrational beliefs, uh, a lot of students will look at this and be like, oh, this sounds right based on the text. But this doesn't answer the question because as all of you have identified, they're not just asking you, what is briefly, what is breezily dismiss, uh, breezily dismiss apparently irrational beliefs means, they're asking more specifically, what does this imply about Vivero de Castro, right? So you're not simply asking, what does this phrase mean? You have to answer the question, what does this imply about Vivero de Castro? All right, that's our first example. Let's run through another, and ideally one will go a little smoother. We'll set up another poll here, and we'll give you all another shot at a practice question. All right, that is time. And you might be thinking, I'm giving you even less time than the last question. The answer is yes. So on the science sections, you actually have less time per question than cars, right? Again, cars, you have 90 minutes for 53 questions. Science sections, you have 95 minutes for 59 questions. So the amount of time you have per question is actually less for the science sections. Now, in this case, uh, the overwhelming majority of you picked A. Now, unfortunately, A is not correct. There are a number of you who picked the correct answer, which is B. Now, of course, let's go ahead and walk through this question, right? So as we said, take a look at the question. Uh, what, what might we want to identify here that could be helpful, right? So they're talking about radioactive decay 
oops, let's not use red, let's use yellow. Uh, the radioactive decay in the PET procedure results in the formation of which atom? Again, uh, you've got keywords, you know, you should probably be looking at the text and uh, they're talking about PET, right? Which they mentioned positron emission tomography, right? And they're talking about the formation of an atom. And I know in terms of atoms, a lot of you sort of zoomed in and, and sort of laser focused on fluorine, right? Which is why the majority of you picked fluorine, but unfortunately the MCAT isn't so uh, easy as find the atom mentioned in the passage, right? It's gonna be a little bit more complicated than that. And uh, here is where there is some science knowledge you are expected to know. But science knowledge that you're expected to know is positron emission, right? That's what PET stands for, positron emission tomography. So what you had to recall is in positron emission, this is a lab technique where, uh, sorry, not a lab technique, it's a form of radioactive decay where the nucleus is going to emit a positron. And something that you have to keep in mind with positron emission is that the nucleus is gonna take a proton, it's gonna convert it into a neutron as well as a positron. So the result is that you're going to lose a proton in positron emission. So in this case, you're starting with 18F, which is fluorine. And you know what's gonna happen is you're going to lose a proton. So you'd then take a look at the periodic table and look for which element has one less proton than fluorine, which indeed is oxygen. Right, so again, just thinking about the strategies, how can you take a look at the question, you know, highlight words effectively to help you find the appropriate part of the text to answer the question. And the second thing is, you know, making sure you can read and understand the question and break it down, right? Find the appropriate part of the text, recognize, hey, they're asking about positron emission, uh, recall what positron emission is and apply it to uh, the atom at hand, get the correct answer of C. Now, uh, something else that I want to mention here on the topic of positron emission is students recall there's a number of different kinds of radioactive active decay. There's alpha decay, there's beta minus decay, there's positron emission, also called beta positive decay. There's uh, electron capture, and there's also gamma decay. There's a lot of students who try to strictly memorize uh, a lot of these decays. And remember what we said earlier, if it's strict memorization, that often doesn't work very well, especially for something like this, where it's so easy to confuse. Oh, for positron emission, is it that the proton number goes up by one or is the number of protons, does it decrease by one? Something like that, where it's so easy to flip, if you try to use uh, pure memorization, it often doesn't work very well. All right, that was our second example. We're gonna take a look at one more example. And again, I'm gonna go ahead and set up the poll and all of you can go ahead and give this a try.
All right, that's time. Again, these questions go fast, right? And before we look at this question, I did see a question in the chat that was asking, for a question like that, if we don't memorize, then how can we approach the question? So the thing that you want to uh, you want to understand for the MCAT is it's not simply about memorization, right? Much better than memorization is understanding what's going on, right? So for a student who's looking at positron emission and they simply memorize positron emission as mass number stays the same, atomic number decreases by one, do you really understand what's happening in positron emission? Right. Compare that to the way I was describing earlier, which is, hey, in positron emission, I'm going to emit a positron. How am I going to get a positron? Well, the nucleus has a proton that it can convert into a neutron that it keeps in a positron it emits. If you're able to run through that logic in your head, you're never going to mix things up because you understand the science content and it's not simply memorization. All right. So uh, for, whoops, went back a couple slides. Um, so here, um, this question is asking uh, post-translational modification. And uh, we've got several words here, right? So post-translational modification of STAT1 by SGK uh, most likely occurs at which of the following residues of the STAT1 primary structure? All right, so at this point, if you've done a good number of MCAT practice questions, you probably recognize that the answer choices refer to amino acids. This is one area where it is pure memorization, right? There, there is no uh, strategy here, right? There's no strategy like, oh, why is K lysine, right? Because there, there's no strategy, it's just defined that way, right? So there is some aspects of MCAT where you do need to have things memorized. But there are many other things where uh, understanding the science content is much more effective than pure memorization. So again, go with the keywords. You've identified the keywords, find them in the passage, right? That's why highlighting can be really helpful. So, hey, we found STAT1, we found SGK, right? And they said, post-translational modification of STAT1 by SGK. So STAT1 is going to be modified by SGK. What is SGK? It's a glucocorticoid regulated kinase. Oh, it's a kinase. What's the science content you should know? A kinase is an enzyme that transfers a phosphate group from one molecule to another. So you have to recall which amino acids can be phosphorylated. And yes, here's another bit of memorization. You have to recall it's almost always going to be STY. And uh, sometimes to a lesser degree, some other amino acids for, for lamb cat, primarily STY, serine, threonine, and tyrosine. And the uh, only answer choice that matches that is going to be D. Yep, very good. Okay, and see a quick question. Uh, what should I do when I feel like I am comfortable with the material, but then feel like I forget everything I know? It doesn't seem like I'm stressed. I make sure I am calm when going through the exam. So a lot of this, uh, you want to take a look at the question, right? So, um, uh, I mean, if you feel like you're forgetting the information, that sounds like it, it could be some testing anxiety, right? Because when you look at this question, when you see the key words and you find them in the passage and you see kinase, your brain needs to essentially click and, and recognize, hey, a kinase, I know what this enzyme is. I know it transfers a phosphate from one molecule to another. If your brain doesn't make that connection, um, but later on when you review the question, you say, oh, I definitely knew that, you do need to think about why you didn't make that connection during the exam, right? Um, so if you find that this is something that happens uh, very often, then sometimes uh, you might want to think about doing some practice questions under untimed conditions, right? If you do the questions under untimed conditions where you don't have any stress or time pressure, are you able to make those connections? Uh, do you not have that situation where you feel like you're forgetting everything? Um, 
If so, that may suggest that the time and the really act of taking the practice exam is leading to some anxiety. And you may want to try some of the strategies that Alex was talking about earlier with meditation and sort of a pre-exam routine. All right. Um, and Destiny, I gave you a minute and a half for that question, uh, which is actually fairly generous for the science sections. For the science sections, uh, it's really closer to a minute per question because you've got 95 minutes, 59 questions, and you've got 10 passages that you have to read through as well. All right. So uh, at this point, uh, I do want to mention a couple of things. I do know we went through several questions with strategies, but I also do want to mention for some of you who are studying for the MCAT and you're having some challenges, uh, Med School Coach, we are here to help you. Right. So if you're not aware, Med School Coach is a company that helps students with every aspect of becoming a physician. We do have a lot of fantastic uh, MCAT products out there that you may have heard of our MCAT prep mobile application, uh, MCAT Go, uh, our YouTube channels, a lot of really great resources. But we also have a team of fantastic MCAT tutors who've all scored between 520 to 528 on the exam that can really help give your MCAT score the boost that it needs. And one of the things that Alex was mentioning earlier is um, sometimes when you're studying for the exam, it can be helpful to look for help from a mentor, right? And if you know someone who can help you with the MCAT, that's great. But if you don't have someone who can provide you with the expertise that you need, Med School Coach can really provide that expertise for you. And one of the things that really makes uh, an MCAT tutor particularly helpful is for many students, you often don't know what you don't know, right? So if you're completing a lot of practice questions and you've taken multiple practice exams and you feel lost and confused as to why your scores aren't improving, I'd highly recommend considering working with one of our MCAT tutors because we can help talk through your exams, go through the practice questions and help identify what errors you might be making, what strategies you may not be using to improve your scores. And on this uh, slide, you can actually see a QR code that you can use to scan to book a meeting with a member of our team. And we can talk with you more about how uh, MCAT tutoring can help improve your score. I'd highly recommend that you consider booking a meeting. And with that, I do want to spend some time uh, answering your questions. So we're going to be going through uh, the Q&A feature because we have a number of questions that have been submitted there. So um, Alex, uh, do you want to take this first one? Uh, the question is, how do you uh, appropriately time manage with cars? Uh, are there specific strategies or techniques here that are different than the other sections? Um, yeah, great question. Cars is definitely the one section that most people struggle with um, timing wise, um, even you know rushing and not being able to get to a couple of passages. So I think the, the best time management strategy is to realize when you're beaten on a question. And what I mean by that is when you're not going to be able to make any more progress. So the self-talk, the indicator, and whether it's time to move on, is do I know what to do next in order to answer the question? And if you're not sure and you're just kind of going back between two answer choices, going back to the passage, rereading the same things, then you just got to move on. I find that is the number one fix um, or the number one um, issue that if fixed, uh, your prime, your timing issues in cars should just evaporate. So, All right. And I'll take this question here. Sophia is asking, uh, what places do you recommend taking a practice exam? Uh, for example, coffee shop. Uh, they've been taking a practice exam in the apartment. Um, so uh, in the psych social section, you probably recall learning about the encoding specificity principle. Right, which is the idea that your ability to recall information is better if your state and context uh, at recall is more similar to 
at the state and context when you were encoding that information. So the idea is, unless you're going to be taking your MCAT exam in your bed, you probably shouldn't be studying in your bed, right? So for that same reason, your MCAT exam is going to be taken in a standardized testing center, which is kind of like an office where there's sort of cubicles and a whole bunch of computers and students sitting in the same room, right? So if you're looking for an environment that best simulates, uh, simulates that environment, try to find something like that. A coffee shop isn't exactly great because it can be loud with a lot of people chattering, right? So, you know, a better place might be something like the library where, you know, it's supposed to be quiet, but there's still some people making the noises of, you know, getting up, moving around that you can expect on test day. All right. So uh, another question that we have here is, um, let's see. Uh, studying for the MCAT is a long process. How can I keep my motivation levels high throughout this period? And how can I effectively balance study time and breaks to avoid burnout? That is a fantastic question uh, because uh, for a lot of a lot of students, uh, let's say you're, you're taking classes part time or full time, or you're working, you may need six seven months in order to get ready for the MCAT to get the score that you want. Um, so for those long period of time, um, I think mental health hygiene is super important. So if you try and go 100 miles an hour for seven months, it's not, you're going to burn out. So find something that's like maintainable. Yes, it's going to be a lot. It's going to be stressful. You're not. You're going to have to cut down on other activities and maybe a little, a little bit of social life. But um, it's only for a time. Um, but having that mental health hygiene with exercise, meditation, taking days off, letting yourself off the hook. Um, if you miss a study day, you know, not walking around with this sort of um, shadow over your head, um, you know, just being able to have a balanced life really is the, is the way to not burn out. Great. And Yara has a question of how do you feel about flashcards or Anki to help with recall? I've been adding it to uh, my everyday studying but I feel like I've been focusing more on memorization than understanding. Do you have any tips on how to approach these study methods and more of a way to understand than memorize? So yes, if uh, Anki uh, or you know really any flashcard application uh, can be really handy to help with some of those topics that you really just have memorized, right? Amino acids, hormones, biochemical pathways. There are a lot of things that you really do need to have memorized for the exam. There are other things uh, such as equations in physics. If you've simply memorized 40 equations for physics, but don't know how to use those equations or when to use these equations, then the memorization doesn't help you, right? Um, and, and part of this is because often there are multiple equations for the same thing, right? For pressure, PV equals NRT, or pressure equals force over area, or um, what else do we have for pressure? We have Pascal's law, right? P1 over A1 equals P2 over A2, right? There's, or gauge pressure, right? Pressure equals density times gravity times depth. There's so many different equations for the same term that if all you're doing is memorizing a lot of equations, it can be really challenging for you to answer MCAT questions correctly, right? So my recommendation is, yes, it's helpful to uh, have the equations memorized, but if you don't have the understanding and don't know how to apply the, the equations and concepts that you've memorized, you're still not going to be able to get a lot of questions correct. So my recommendation is, yes, it's fine to use Anki flashcards, but when you're memorizing something, you really want to ask yourself, do I understand what I'm memorizing? And if you do, great, go ahead. But if you're uh, memorizing a card and you're like, I'm memorizing this, but I don't really understand what exactly it is I'm memorizing, my recommendation would be to go to your MCAT books, find that term uh, in your books and read about that topic, right? So that way you have both the memorization and understanding that's really going to improve your score. Alternatively, 
these days, it's really easy just to go to YouTube, right? Go to YouTube, type in the topic that uh, you wanted uh, to better understand. You can often find a lot of uh, helpful videos to help your understanding. All right. Um, and uh, there's a quick question about the app, right? Um, so for the prep app, um, the prep app is for individuals, right? So I'm going to drop that link again in the chat. So if any of you uh, wanted to get a lifetime subscription to the MCAP prep app, I'm going to put the link in the chat again. Um, again, this link is only going to be active for the next 24 hours. Um, and it's for one person per purchase. Uh, there's another question uh, with the prep app, which is, if you've already uh, signed up with a subscription, what can you do? Um, so what you can do is we can't really do anything about your previous subscription, but once your current subscription ends, uh, you can of course cancel it. And if you've signed up for this lifetime subscription, your lifetime subscription will kick in. You'll never be charged again. All right. Um, another question that uh, Alex, you can take on is uh, one and a half months until the MCAT with little time outside uh, of classes uh, to study for the exam because they are, are a full-time student. Uh, do you have study tips and, and uh, have any areas you would recommend focusing on? Yes, so that's a, that's a tough one. Um, that is a tough one. So, um, Coming from somebody who had to study for their MCAT, working full time and, and taking some classes, you you need to be really. The first thing I'll say is be very honest with yourself of when you're going to be ready. Um, so if those commitments are making it impossible for you to improve, then something might need to might need to change. Um, and so that's the the hard truth. But let's put that aside um, and go for some advice if. Uh, if you are making improvements and whatnot in your test date coming up, I would spend uh, probably about 75% of your time um, doing practice questions, including full length exams and reviewing those. And then about 25% or so of your time just continuing to review old topics in the form of flashcards or study sheets or you know going back and reading your book if you need to because you always have to be seeing as much of the content as possible. And I think a 75, 25% split leading into the exam is kind of, is probably the right, the right uh, balance. Great. All right. Well, unfortunately, that's really all the time we have this evening uh, for this webinar. So I do want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. We hope that we are able to uh, share some helpful information. And once again, uh, if you're interested in working with an MCAT expert, just go ahead and use this QR code, book a meeting, and we'd be happy to speak with you. Otherwise, hope you all have a good rest of your evening, and I wish you all the best of luck with your MCAT exams.